Good evening, and thank you for joining us. This evening, it is the pleasure and privilege of the British Council Library and the British Council Safeguarding Team, which is mandated to ensure the protection and welfare of children and adults who come into contact with the British Council and its associates to host Dr. Hiranti Vijaymana to this edition of our In Conversation With series. Dr. Vijaymana is a graduate of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Thereafter, she obtained a public health degree from the Harvard School of Public Health, Boston, USA. Her work for children has spanned many decades and many sectors, from the Family Planning Association to UNICEF, as chairperson of the National Child Protection Authority, and finally, her appointment to the UN International Monitoring Committee on Child Rights. She, she was closely involved in the successful polio eradication campaign in Sri Lanka. During the years of conflict, she worked tirelessly to ensure access to public and maternal health services and on the rehabilitation of child soldiers. She has passionately led campaigns focusing on child nutrition and the promotion of growth monitoring, the introduction of a local oral rehydration salt called Jeevani, which helped eliminate the death of children due to diarrhea. And she has also worked on the promotion of early childhood development and the banning of corporal punishment in homes and schools. This evening, we talked to her not only about her experiences and years of service committed to bringing about lasting positive change in the lives of all children through the promotion of the Child Rights Convention, but we also refer to her extraordinary biographical account in the best interest of every child, which offers an insider viewpoint to those who are committed to ensuring that the rights of every child are upheld and respected and we will also talk to her about the situation of children in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Dr. Vijaymana, for accepting our invitation to speak to us. And congratulations on your autobiographical account in the very best interest of every child. Sorry, in the best interest of every child, which is also a timely tribute to the medical personnel, security, security forces, social services workers, and many others and which I know will be very informative, not only to those in your field, but to readers in general. I really enjoyed your career and, and the, uh, following your career in your book and the insights into so many health services we take for granted today, Dr. Vijay Mayana. So thank you very much for that wonderful work. Um, would, you like, would you like me to jump straight in and ask you my first set of questions? Can you hear me? Ah, okay. Okay. Yes, that would be nice. Okay. Yeah. So, Doctor Vijaymana, everybody is talking about the pandemic. That's all we seem to talk about. So, I would like to begin with asking you about how this mm -hmm. pandemic. I would like to hear on how it has impacted our children today, and what you think will be those, the, what, what we will see as lasting impacts of the pandemic on children. Well, uh, yes, as you say, everyone's talking about the pandemic. Uh, but I mean, let's remember that this is not first pandemic or epidemic that Sri Lanka has gone through. Over the years, we have gone through so many, many uh, uh, issues that children have. For example, the whole polio campaign was because children were getting polio and, and, and it was affecting them and, and it, it affected their lives. But we were able to overcome that. Similarly, uh, measles, mumps, whooping cough, diphtheria, these were all diseases which were there in children uh, over the years. But with preventive measures, with um, uh, giving, uh, uh, preventing services, also telling them, giving them the vaccine, we were able to, uh, we were actually one of the, I think we were the first country in Asia to eradicate polio. Polio was very common. But with the whole campaign on getting mothers, families to give the vaccination, we were able to um, eliminate polio. So I, I think where the pandemic is concerned, I think these past experiences that Sri Lanka has gone through with public health has been very useful. 
and has made us also rejuvenate our public health services. Because I believe that, uh, not because I'm a public health physician, but I think prevention is much better than cure. Where children are concerned, or even adults for that matter, if there are methods by which we can prevent a disease, that is the best. It is cost effective, it's easy, and uh, you know the chances of the child continue to live a full life uh, is, a, is a gift we can give them. So these are things that Sri Lanka actually went through long before the pandemic. The measles month, swooping cough, diphtheria, tetanus, all these things we went through before the pandemic. And I, that experience, I think, made our medical services really strengthen preventive health. And I think that has also played a role in trying to control uh, the current pandemic, which might not be the last. It may be one of many to follow. We don't know. So I think uh, a greater accent on preventive uh, diseases and also epidemics, uh, I think, should be the key. Not just only looking after people, um, individuals in hospitals if they have an illness, but looking at communities and looking at uh, the whole, uh, um, you know, and particularly children, because our interest actually in, tra in children. Let's remember, they are the future. If Sri Lanka is to do well, we have to look after our children. They are the ones who will eventually take this country forward. So um, I think a uh, lot to learn from the past, and we have learned from the past. And I'm, I'm sure even the pandemic, the public health personnel are doing their very, very best to on the prevention aspects. But, but what do you um, think would be an impact on the early childhood development? Because a lot of children now have been deprived of, I mean, everywhere, globally, not, not just in Sri Lanka. They have been sort of yeah. kept away from other children. So how do you think that would impact on, yeah. because I think you're talking, well, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, so, well, I mean, it is a tremendous challenge because, I mean, you have to keep children indoors, they can't play, they don't have the, uh, you know, the, the, the freedom they had before. Uh, but, you know, children, I have worked with children, not only my own children, but I've worked with children out there in the wilderness. I mean, they are amazing. I used to get children to come to talk to them and tell them about some of the preventive health programs we do, about good nutrition. And they are very receptive. So I think we need to engage children on how we can prevent it, safety precautions we have to take. Uh, let's face it, diseases there are, prevent, um, uh, all sorts of diseases are there. The best way to deal with a disease is to prevent it, not to wait till someone gets sick. And, and the parents, the family, and the child have to all get together to do the prevention part. And let me tell you, media is uh, so important. Actually, for most of my campaigns, I must say, give a big bouquet to the media because it was not only television, it was radio, which is for a family is actually listen to the radio more than they do even television. And and the print media, because we have a high literacy rate among our people in Sri Lanka. So we need to use these channels to get across messages on how children can prevent diseases and families can prevent diseases occurring and that I think is a, is a way forward. So to get away from that, I also want to ask you, you, you spoke about in your book about this period of early childhood development, the period from the time of birth until three years of age. You have said, I'm quoting, the experience of, experiences yes. of children during this time span and the activities they engage in have a significant and important impact on the rest of their life. So I just want to know what what you think might be impacts that we would see. Have, have you? Well, uh, yes, uh, I, I must thank you for bringing up that point because I think it's a very important point. Let's face it, I mean, uh, all the research has shown that, uh, you know, that unfortunately in many communities and in Sri Lanka, everyone gets excited when a child is doing their O-level, their A-level, getting into university, that's the time they all get excited and, you know, families try to get tuition for their name. But the maximum amount of the human, uh, the child's brain development and capacity to learn is established in early childhood, that is from birth to three years, three years to five years, and, uh, and, and you know, preschools, of course, have 
Sri Lanka has been involved in having uh, doing preschools, which are excellent when they are run well, and also teaching mothers about you can do also early childhood stimulation in homes. There are lots of things UNICEF has uh, have been doing in programs to stimulate them mentally, even in a home environment, with simple things, maybe just things you find out in a wood or a garden or a you know and in homes. So stimulation of the mind, and I'm afraid not watching a lot of TV, but actually, uh, you know, using your mind to do things, to make things, to, so, uh, well, it, it used to be called Montessori at one point of time, as you all know, but later on, we called it early childhood development. So keep stimulating the child's mind from birth to three years, three years to five years, and then, of course, they enter school, and the school also then has to continue the stimulation and establish that huge capacity that children have for learning. The learning is there because schools are there, teachers are there, we have free education, we have free education. And, but we should not let children drop out, we should not let children not be able to cope with the work they have. So, we, you know, we just have to follow these rules which are, which are known all over the world. They have been tested and tried. Uh, and uh, so those are things that we can do. And don't wait the child goes gets into university age to put him or her into university by that time the work should have been done in early childhood frankly if you do early childhood well preschool well the child will definitely get in and do well eventually it's not at that final stage but at the beginning but for that we need good parenting practices we need parents to be involved and we need more uh, preschools uh, so that uh, you know children uh, children uh, learn uh, how and and they are stimulated. The whole point is the stimulation of their brains, which are sort of active, very active at that age. And if we can do some of these things, which we have done, programs have been done on those kinds of things. I think we can actually ask our Sri Lankan students do big. In general, they do very well. I mean, I'm amazed sometimes when I go to a village and I see talk to these uh, children. They are great. They are fine, you know. But but. They can't do it alone. Parents have to participate. The family has to participate. And I think that's that's the way to go. You spoke about your work at uh, UNICEF and you brought great benefits to this country. I believe when you started out there, you were involved with the disbursement of a substantial grant and to ensure the implementation of the grant according to the government of Sri Lanka's program plans for establishing and expanding family health in Sri Lanka. Could you tell us something about what the outcomes of that grant were? You know, what, what was facilitated by the grant and what, what impact has it had on access to health for children? Well, I mean, I think uh, UNICEF played a very important role. Well, I was in UNICEF and I had access to, I had access to uh, resources. And uh, I mean, we you know, UNICEF was a, in a way a unique organization. It was an organization for children. And we worked very much hand in hand with the government, you know, with the government authorities, the, the family health workers, the midwives, the medical officers of health. We were teams, actually. I used to go to all these areas even during the dreadful time of the, of the conflict because we thought we should not let children suffer because of the conflict. We need to continue with the services that they need and they deserve and they should have. So uh, so it was a sort of a good partnership we had with the family health workers, family health staff, uh, also with medical officers of health out there in the wilderness, some of them in very distant places where you know, the roads were mined and they couldn't travel. Uh, even the forces actually helped us quite a lot in providing services, the military, because they were very active during the war times. Uh, I, I don't know. It was uh, it was sad that Sri Lanka had to go through a war and and do so many precious lives. But on the other hand, uh, we did not let down our children. Whatever services they needed, those services were prepared, and and a lot of supplies had to actually come by air because roads were mined. You couldn't go on roads, and uh, so these kinds of things happen. And I, I think all in all, Sri, Sri, I mean, I was proud to be part of this. Uh, a team in Sri Lanka to make sure that health services wouldn't suffer, family health would go on, our children, infant mortality levels continued to be low, 
uh, and uh, and we did all those kinds of things to make lives better for children of this country. So, Dr. Vijay Mana, um, I mean, what, what, the, how can we springboard from those achievements into the future? I mean, you know, I, how can we make sure that there are lasting impacts of that of those of these sort of grants that come into the country and that are utilized like this what suggestion well uh, yes well you know we have to because every year the right number of children being born every year i mean that doesn't stop and every new child who is born needs that particular service during the delivery has to be good. The mother has to be looked after. Safe delivery. Uh, child needs certain things during the infancy, birth to one. Then from one to three years, the child needs services from three to five years. And even during adolescence, I mean, let's remember, it's not only the small children who matter, it's adolescence. Uh, it's a very difficult period for a child 10 to 18. And uh, I'm afraid our adolescent services are not all that good. They should be strengthened. The child is changing, uh, he or she's, her body is changing, and sometimes it's difficult for, for, for young uh, children during the day. So it's really 18. So it's only when a child is 18 that we can say, fine, we are given the health services needed, the mental health support they need, uh, they have been able to go to school and learn, and so the, all these components have to be put into place and we can build a wonderful new generation uh, of Sri Lankans if we do that. Many of the problems adults even today have, have a root somewhere in their parenthood. Either the parents have, have had problems or there's been domestic violence or they haven't had the right kind of food or they haven't been sent to school regularly. The quality of uh, uh, teaching they went through was not good. So a lot of it, we try to remedy it when they are adults. That's too late. We have to start with children. You know, the, the, the childhood is the beginning. So if those are the roots of there are, are roots. If the roots are strong and then the, the person also becomes strong. So I think much more attention is needed. And also I would like to stress on prevention because when when a when a when things happen when, to a child, uh, say a child has got polio, it's too late then. Preventing it is what we need to do. Malnutrition, for example. We need to prevent malnutrition. We can't wait for malnutrition to manifest and then something about it. Social problems. Adolescents have a lot of problems because they are changing from being a child to an adult and in between they go through adolescence and they have a lot of difficulties which we, parents may not be aware of, families are not aware of and don't give necessary soap to them. Uh, they are pushed with the education system, as we all know, there is a huge push on them in terms of you do this, get eight days, four days, all this business. Can the child really do it or not? Do they get the right help to do it? There are lots of, there are lots of things that we need to look at. And uh, I think Sri Lanka is a little country, I mean, relatively compared to Africa and other countries in Asia, I've been all over the world and I can tell you, then it's a smaller number of people, smaller population, and a literate population. My goodness, you can do a lot. Media can do a lot, and media has done a lot, actually. So, um, I mean, in terms of, because I believe that the wealth of a country is not the skyscraper and the three-story buildings or whatever, 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 or the tamasha that, I'm sorry to say, but the politicians have. The strength of the country is people of the country and the people of the country begins to learn of the country so if we do it right for our children the people will turn out right and the country also will uh, turn out right unfortunately children don't have a voice now i mean i'm talking on their behalf i, I want but to i want to get that. Talk on yeah i want to actually get yes. to that I, when, when you said about the voice of the child mm -hmm. because i want to talk um do we still yes. have to, okay um i want to talk about the committee on the rights of the child which is a body of 18 independent experts that monitors implementation of the convention of, on the rights of the child I'm, I'm elaborating for people who may not know what the crc is about by states parties 
It also monitors implementations of two optional protocols to the convention. And on December 19, uh, 2011, the UN General Assembly approved a third optional protocol on a communications procedure which will allow ch individual children to submit complaints regarding specific violations of their rights under the convention and its first two optional protocols. You have, sa you have said, uh, Dr. Vijaymana, that implementing the CRC and upholding the best interest of the child is the very best we can do for our children. I would like you, if you could, to share some of you know, your, your, your experiences and some of the highlights of your work in the CRC. Because we were talking about, you know, children and their voices being heard and their rights. Well, I must tell you, as a member of the CRC committee, which I I I I, I worked in when I was in, when I used to go to for the meetings, uh, and I realized actually, uh, you know, listening to some of the things that were discussed there, and also I studied the CRC with greater depth. Sorry to say, but uh, you know, really, Sri Lankan children do very few. Sri Lankan children have been given that right to be able to express their opinion or uh, be listened to. For example, corporal punishment. We know it is a form of violence. You are not supposed to use corporal punishment to uh, to. Uh, it might be a teacher, it might be a parent, it may be someone else, whatever. But it's all a lot of work that, that we try to do in motion, corporal punishment continue. We said use non-violent um, non methods of, of uh, discipline. Discipline is important for children. I, I don't say that discipline is not important, but not the use of physical force. And I wonder sometimes the huge amount of uh, physical force that is used, you know, two, two people meet somewhere, that fellow hits that other fellow, this one hits that, that fellow, all this kind of violence is going on in our society. Domestic violence is, my goodness, rampant. Women have given a lot of impression on domestic violence. The school um, must have made the wrong way and then that fellow guy comes and gives the wife a slap. What's the meaning of that? That's just violence, you see. And I think the whole point that if we focus on non-violent methods of punishment and not use corporal punishment and teach children in a different way how they should follow uh, certain norms and uh, traditions then i think you know we can also reduce the violence in our society actually most of the things that we want to improve in our society have to start from childhood it can't start when you're three or 25 you can put the fellow into a jail cell, but then what? Is that the answer? That's not the answer. We need to prevent it. So we must start with the children. They need to know there are certain norms, there are certain uh, uh, things that you just do, certain things you don't do. Problem is the parents are more interested in the A-level and the whatever, I don't know, getting the shishakwear and that yeah, part of it. Sure. But they don't do that. The real living part. You have to, you have to be able to live a decent, good life, then all the other things follow. So I, I think there's a lot of work still ahead for us to do. Um, and it's not easy. But I mean, let's start somewhere. I don't know. That's, I think, something we need so, to do. We so have, I mean, they have an initiative. No, um, but Dr. Vijay Manu, yeah. okay, so what are, what are those other methods of disciplining that, you know, you could suggest to parents? Because maybe, yeah. you know, yeah. The easiest thing, I suppose, yeah. is yeah. you know what yeah. you have been resorting to. Yeah. So. Very, very simple things like you cut down their play play time. Uh, you tell them to well, this writing this uh, thing. I'm not going to do this a hundred times. Uh, some people do that kind of thing. Uh, you restrict some of the fun things they do. I mean, there are there are non-violent methods in which you can make children feel if you do this, it's wrong. And you will be punished. There's a little punishment for that. But it doesn't have to be any violence. It can be done in a different. There's something that the child enjoys watching TV at 6 o'clock every day, 6 in the evening. Sorry, you didn't do your homework, you didn't whatever, you know. We, you, have to, you have to forego that, that privilege. So, I mean, you have to use those kinds of things because childhood is the time that they absorb it that's the time you can't do it when they are 18 or 19 or whatever it's too late 
So if children learn discipline, they learn that violence is not, should not be allowed. It must, uh, I think that we could actually make a big difference in our whole society. Because uh, I she think this has I'm sorry, I have, I have seen in some boutiques, I have seen way well, I mean, it's so primitive, I tell you, it really is primitive. So let's start, even in a few areas, even if it doesn't happen all over, few people can start a campaign. There have been campaigns, but none have continued and none, and none have ended up being creating, and media can, of course, should play a big role. You spoke about teenage children and you have dedicated an entire chapter of your book to challenges when dealing with <laughs> adolescent children. We have many young members, Dr. Yes. Vitamana, especially our teens and also we have students in our classrooms who are adolescents. So, and I'm certain their parents yes. would appreciate some words of guidance from you, drawn from your you know, experience and yes. your knowledge. So, to go back to you know yes. the whole pandemic and children not socializing and all yeah. that what what would what how would what guidelines or guidances would you give to these parents what would you say to them about adolescent children no i mean yeah no let's face it the parents have to realize that adolescence is a very difficult time for a 10 to 18. their hormones are raging their bodies are raging uh, certain things they can't understand maybe they have feelings they you know can't control so parents have to learn that adolescence is a quite a different period of time in a child to when the child was three or four when you say sit they sat and walk they walk or eight and they were told to be adolescence is a time when the body is growing uh, sexual you know there's sexuality issues um, and the body is changing and maybe the child is unaware and it's important for parents to be led uh, to be uh, given information on how they can talk to their children we did a program once for parents because it's part most of it is connected with parenting they yeah, think how can we talk to our children about this if you feel shy if you feel this you know. so i think it's uh, the public health system at that time so several years ago used to have little meetings for parents parenting to promote good parenting that is the best gift you can give your child not uh, you know material thing good parenting explain to them let the child be able to come and talk to the parent if they feel uh, you know their sexual organs are developing and then they feel shy about it they should be able to come and tell the parent look this is happening then the parent should also be made aware of how he, he or she can take that don't worry that's how it is a plant growing human beings have to go from childhood to adolescence to adulthood and that change must be smooth uh, i mean the child shouldn't be shy and you know i, I, you know, I, I can't you know my body is this they, they don't know whom to talk to actually i must say that uh, when it, uh, it because i'm a, maybe because i'm a doctor many of the meetings i went to when i said does anyone have a question all the adolescent people put up their hands and I call them to a room and I talk and they are quite happy talking to me but that's because they think I'm a doctor and I know everything. But you can't only rely on doctors, all the doctors don't have time to be talking to children. So we have to, we have, to have parenting, knowledge on parenting given to children. We give knowledge on early childhood, we give knowledge when they are small how to look after them and babies. But we don't give much information on uh, this. Uh, adolescents, their bodies are changing, they feel shy, the girls get, you know, they don't want to wear certain clothes and all. We don't, we should pay more attention to them. But that is the link from between early, ch early childhood, childhood and adulthood and a very important part of uh, their life. So, uh, there are, I mean, there's loads of work that we have to do in Sri Lanka uh, for our children. But I think if a few even maybe non-governmental organizations, volunteer organizations, most of the time it's just simple, actually it's sort of common sense to be honest with you. And uh, it's, you know, giving this information to children is part of child protection. Okay. Does that make sense, I hope. <laughs> 
well, I hope so. I'm not a parent, but I'm sure parents will empathize and, you know, understand what, what you're saying and where you're coming from. And I hope it will be useful because you're right. A lot of the time it is listening to the children, isn't it? And having a conversation. It's a dialogue. And I think the dialogue is what is missing sometimes in a lot of scenarios. Um, can I take you to, um, I'm, I want to go back in time a little bit and go back to this eradicating yes. polio because I, I don't think a lot of children even know yes. about polio. They don't even know what polio is. Um, and, yeah. and we were talking about successful yeah. vaccination programs. So the smallpox vaccine is, a, I think I'm one of the last to have a yes, right. vaccination. Right. So, you know, I, I think yes. in 1970 or something, I think they stopped giving the, the smallpox vaccine. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so could you talk a little bit about this polio vaccine and eradicating polio in Sri Lanka and why it was so important? Like what impact polio had on our health services and on our children? And, you know, why it was such yeah. a significant thing? Well, you know, the important thing was that it was so easy to bring. It was a few drops of polio vaccine. I mean, it, 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 it's just a few drops of vaccine that we had to get into. It, it was so cost effective, so easy to do. And my goodness, this uh, the child would never have to drag a polio leg or not be able to do things because uh, it was a preventable disease. The point is this. We should, as a country, and I think uh, anything that is preventable, there are things that are not preventable. I'll tell you, there are carcinomas you can't prevent. There might be some other, if someone you know, has a very major uh, sort of uh, accident or something, you can't fix stuff. But polio, few drops, why not? It's such an easy thing to prevent, and that I'm, I'm so glad and proud that Sri Lanka made that choice immediately. I was at that time working for UNICEF, and even uh, the head of UNICEF, uh, Jim Grant, he came all the way from New York for the launch, and he was I was quite friendly with him actually, and he said, Hiranti, do one thing, get Sri Lanka free of polio. I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do, Jim, and, uh, and we ran the campaign, and uh, I mean, it was so, um, I mean, sort of thing, uh, it made us so happy to think that, you know, so many children who would have been crippled with the polio leg didn't have. Anything that we can prevent, we should put our focus on. There are things we can't prevent. There are certain cancers we may not be able to prevent. There might be an accident which takes place. Which we, actually, even accidents we can prevent with a good accident prevention program where children are protected. You know, the children going on little motorbikes on behind. I mean, I did a campaign on that because so dangerous this little child sitting in a motor bicycle with an adult and then they meet with an accident. And so accidents also are things that we need. So prevention, to be honest with you, a lot of things children have to get uh, fall ill because of uh, poor prevention. So, I mean, we need, just need to refocus. It's, it's not a difficult thing. We just need to refocus and make sure that those things happen because uh, they have a long-lasting impact on children. So, I mean, I remember this polio vaccine tasted very nasty, Dr. Vijaymana. It was a very unpleasant tasting few drops that were... I still I still know, remember the taste of it. But I, I was shown people who had polio at the time and I was told that this is the reason yes. I was given it so that I will not get... Yes. and I will not be crippled. But yeah, yeah, but but this is yeah. so since 1993. I think the last case that we had was 1993. So we have a yes, you still give yes. the vaccine to children. Yes. Now and and, and, and the thing is that it gave given after birth, so it's I mean it's an easy thing to do. You know, it's just given after birth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so uh, it's. any any kind of I would say just not only polio, but I think any vaccine or drug which can prevent a disease, I think should have a place in a society. Once you get a disease, to deal with it is so much more difficult, so much more costly, and so much more complicated. So, well, maybe because I'm a public health person, my, and as for a developing country, we should focus as much as we can on preventive health. And also, Good parent, promoting good parenting and also giving that information to family. 
I mean, the family needs that information. Sometimes families do things without really, you know, knowing, uh, maybe because of ignorance. So we should not allow that. And I think in a country like Sri Lanka, where so many people, um, uh, you know, whatever it is, they are literate. They read the newspapers. They, you know, try like to know about things. They watch TV. You know, we can give that information to them and and, and build a build a health uh, young generation who can really take this country forward and I think that is a good goal for us to have. Uh, I would think more than the skyscrapers and all the apartment blocks etc. etc. that are popping out all over the city. If we can focus on our children and build a healthy child generation to take this country forward it will be better than the skyscrapers. But it's, it's all part of Sorry. this journey. <laughs> It's all part of the journey we call progress, Dr. Vijay Manas. So I think, but you're right. It, yes. it has to go in tandem. It has to go in tandem. And you've been yes. talking about parenting. I also, I mean, I, yes. I I know that it's not very often that our parents get a chance to, um, you know, really sort of bombard a doctor with all the little questions that must be, wor mm -hmm. you know, worrying them and wanting, they, they may be wanting to talk about. But... I would like if you if you wouldn't mind sharing some of your insights because you are a doctor you've had a great career I know your husband yeah. is also a doctor yeah. but you you raised two children so what uh, what advice could you give or what insights mm -hmm. could you give to to families like yours who are juggling careers and also raising children uh, what would you draw from your life to share yeah. Well, actually, it's a juggling act. I can tell you, it was a real juggle, juggling act. And uh, I got support from my own mother because she was not a working mother, so she helped a lot to fill in the gaps. And uh, we, uh, right along, and I, just not only me, but many, many lady doctors like me, we somehow managed to fit in to do for children. It's it's just a question of uh, how you place priorities. Other things that we didn't do, I mean, which uh, we would have done, uh, we never went out or for parties or gallivanting or whatever, but it doesn't do. It was always work and our children, and of course, they had to get through their O levels and A levels, and all those things had to be done by a parent. So, parenting, um, parenting, I think, particularly for a working mother, is, is quite a challenge. But, it's just a question of how you organize your life. It's uh, the priority and priority on children is important. I think most, I would say quite, most of the Sri Lankan mothers do believe, um, I mean, that is the time that you have to devote to children. So you juggle away and you organize your life accordingly. And uh, well, I think if people like me did it, I'm sure everyone can. I mean, it's, it's just a question of how you, you can't actually dedicate it to someone else all the time. You can, you know, people have tuition masters and maybe a grandmother, well, my mother did certainly did help me a lot because if I was not available, you know, she was always there. And we have extended family anyway. It's a sort of a pattern in our villages, so extended family is not an unusual thing. Uh, but we have to remember this fragile childhood we must always remember the best you can do, you must do when the when your child is a child. After they are 18 and an adult and they have gone into the world, very difficult. But before, that's the time to do it. And when they are really young and in, a, in many ways helpless, you know, a newborn baby is really helpless. That is the time from birth to one year, then one to three years, those are the times you need to spend time, however difficult it is, however much you have some exciting job to do, you have to put the child first, what we say, put the child first. And then you will sow the seeds of a, an adult who will be fulfilled, who will be able to fulfill their full potential and eventually contribute to this country also. So, yeah, I mean, but okay, so that is about feeding them true. their mind. But also, I you 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 led campaigns on child nutrition and growth monitoring, and I yes. we didn't really talk about those. I would really like for you to say a little bit about yes. those efforts also. Yes. 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 Now, growth monitoring was suffer was 
sort of a new phenomenon because no one we really thought that growth should be monitored with the scale the kid keeps breast milk and some um, other food and you did actually monitor the child growing but it was actually through a unicef initiative that they said you have to weigh the child you have to weigh the child to know whether the child is growing or not growing you can't just look and say no no he he is growing you, you can't do that so this whole growth monitoring program with a growth chart which i must say the growth chart was something that was developed to actually monitor and, and meet uh, family health workers made sure every child was weighed so you can't say i gave the fellow three meals and accept it if the weight is not going up there's something wrong going on i can tell you i have seen a lot of growth charts where something wrong on because if they gave the food they said they did the child wouldn't have been static so the growth was a very useful device and that we used to monitor and actually then there was a pressure on the parent to make sure the child got food that the child needed to grow that without the food the child cannot grow so i think the growth chart may be and and you know it's i i i of course have this uh, great uh, great admiration for our village families you know i just had to get a bunch of women together tell them what it was this is what it, it will be your child will grow and develop well you need to know that's how he or she will become a successful dad i just had to tell them that and they just yapped it all up they said of course doctor will do it i mean no one i tell you no one said you know i what is this nonsense of what is way we don't we don't want it all never i'm telling you and as many years of work they all said thank you we didn't know you have explained it to us and we will make sure our child goes to the clinic and gets weighed that we know that they are taking an adequate quantity of food so uh, i have a great admiration for our village people because you know they gave me such fantastic support and i couldn't do some of it i mean i had to get them to do it for their children and they did so i think we can be proud of the nation hmm? thank you doctor i'd like to just close with with just from you to here overall generally what any any adult or, or hmm. human being can do to safeguard a child to make sure i mean it doesn't have to be a parent it doesn't have to be a guardian but as an adult what we can do to make yes. to make a child feel safer in an in an environment that they coming to what, what what would you i mean what guidance would you give us no the thing is that when you have a child you know the child changes no at birth well, the little fellow is just in a cot doing nothing much and there's nothing really major that they give you breast milk feed or that business and then they start growing you know uh, time is valuable so you have to you know as a parent you have to give time to do those things for your children maybe you want someone to help you as a grandparent grandparents actually have done a lot of good work i i must say grandparent my grandmother did a enormous amount for my children so you can all we have this extended family system so grandparents can do but you need to you know you the child needs time you can't just see the child for 5 minutes in the morning and be at till you know 8 o'clock in the night that kind of thing it, it just doesn't work you need to spend time or have a surrogate who can do it or someone else who can do it it doesn't matter sometimes you may need to have someone else but children need attention they are helpless they, they are just you know baby you know, think of a little baby cot and anything be more helpless a little baby in a cot can't talk can't walk can't say anything just there totally dependent on a caregiver mother or someone else so uh, we need to keep that in mind of course by the time they be preschool or from 4 or 5 or then then the independence starts and they can do things for their children those are also things that we need to teach, teach them they don't have to have parents doing everything for them i don't i don't believe in that they need to learn from at the early in western countries they practically make sure they do Uh, because they don't have ayas and all the rest of it so um but i mean we have to give the child a place the child is a very precious gift you know 
I mean, we don't value it. We don't think of it. It's a human being. It's a, 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 a child. It, it, everything is there. Potential is there. The, it's just a question of doing right and nurturing and getting the best out of them, and so that then they can, you know, uh, you know, take their place in society. A lot of things that problems that we have with adults, I think, have started because of neglecting childhood. I'm sorry to say, neglecting childhood is terrible. Very bad because uh, uh, it cannot be remedied. You can't go back to being a child. You can't go back to being three and four and five. You can't. It's over. So I think it's important for young mothers. It's not the question of giving the child without the party dress to wear. I mean, I sometimes I see these little girls wearing beautiful clothes. And you don't need to give the clothes if you give the attention and love. That's all they need. Material things don't really matter. It's a dominant affection. And understanding that is important. That's the answer of question. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> That's a wonderful place to end our discussion. Thank you so much for making the time to share with us all your thoughts and your insights from your years of dedicated service and to the well-being of children and to this country. Thank you so much for making the time. We we absolutely appreciate it. We hope that this that your passion to serve will be an inspiration to those working to make a better Sri Lanka for all of us. Thank you to Varuni for her support behind the scenes and for liaising with me. And thank you to Nirmali. Thank you to you, to the audience, for watching us and listening to us. And we hope you will take away some useful information from this discussion. Thank you to Shiroma in the library and Tissa and Misha from our safeguarding team and for Safra for, as always, supporting us behind the scenes. For those who still like the traditional feel of a book in their hands, we have an online book ordering service. You can access all our wonderful books from our libraries. You only have to go online and place your book order if you're a library member, and you can, you can come and pick up your books. For those who still are absolutely addicted to a device, we have a wonderful digital library with many, many resources from music to movies to books to audiobooks to magazines. So, I mean, if you haven't explored our digital library, I welcome you to do so. It's, it's all available online and you from the British Council website. So on behalf of the British Council Library and the British Council Safeguarding and Child Protection Team, I'm saying thank you, good night, Keep reading and engaging with all the wonderful resources we have in our libraries for your growth and development and for your child's growth and development. Stay well and stay safe. Good night. <laughs>